As we continue to be mindful of Christmas and the birth of Christ, we want to continue lighting the candles. So, Jody, if you'll, we want to light the first purple candle, the prophet's candle, representing hope. It's hard for us to fathom and comprehend, but 700 years before God would become flesh, Isaiah prophesied of Christ's birth. And purple represents royalty. It represents repentance. It represents fasting. They hope for the Messiah's uh, arrival. And the second candle, which would be the purple candle, represents faith. And this is called the Bethlehem's candle. And Micah also prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And then thirdly, the pink candle in the front It's the shepherd's candle. And to those shepherds, great joy came to them as the angels announced that Jesus came from humble, unimportant people like like them. And it brought them great joy. And then today, the fourth candle, the purple candle, the angel's candle. Of course, in Luke 2, verses 8 through 20, the angels announced that Jesus came, Brother Leon, to bring peace, to bring peace. He came to bring people close to God and to each other. And so uh, for those of you that will be able to join us for our Christmas Eve candlelight service, we will light the white candle Christmas Eve. So come and be a part of that at 6 o'clock this Christmas Eve evening. If you will, take your Bible and turn to Psalm 72. As we continue to journey through the Psalms of the Savior, or Songs of the Savior. And today's message title is The Perfect King. The Perfect King. While you're turning there, I want you to listen to this verse. Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God in whom I take refuge. He is the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And I want to ask you a question today. What are you holding on to? You know, we sing an old hymn, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages, let His praises Ring, glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. 2020 has been an interesting year, to say the least. And I want to ask you, today, December the 20th, what are you standing on? What are you holding on to you? As we've marched through these psalms, you remember we started out with Psalms 2. And the question was asked, why do the nations rage? And it ended, said, it ended this way, blessed are those who take refuge in the Lord. Blessed are those who hold on to the Lord and let the Lord hold on to them. Blessed are the Lord who trust in Him. Blessed are those who stand on the promises. And, and then the following Sunday, Psalm 22, we talked about the suffering Messiah. Uh, in, in, in Psalm 22, that prayer, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ went to the cross for us and for the lost. And in Psalm 110 last week, we talked about the eternal priest or the priest king. And today we're talking about the perfect king. And what's interesting is as we read this, Psalm, this Psalm uh, 72, uh, I'm going to read the text, verses 18 and 19, but we're going to look at the psalm. But at the end of this psalm, this is what it says in verses 18 and 19. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory Amen and amen. Wouldn't you love 
to turn on your TV and all the news stations talking about the glory of God? Wouldn't you love, hey, let's, let's, let's get away from the sides. I don't care if it's CNN, Fox, Newsmax, OAN, all of the, the labels we've given all of these channels. If all of them came on the air and said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Well, folks, guess what? That's our job. That's our job. That's the body of Christ's job. And what I want to talk about and what I want you to see in this passage of Scripture as we get ready to uh, get, gather uh, our families and open up presents and, 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 and give and receive, I, I want us to, to think about the perfect king. And, and what happens is, as, as, as the psalmist is talking about an earthly king, he's also prophetically talking about the perfect king. So as we're looking at his comments on an earthly king, you will see the distinction. There's been no other king like Jesus. Amen? He is the only perfect king. He's the one that we get to hold on to. He's the one that's holding on to us. He's the one that's preparing a place for us in heaven. It's all about Jesus. And so I ask you, as your brother in Christ, as your pastor, as your friend, who are you holding on to today? Are you holding on to King Jesus? Have you ever noticed that a lot of the songs during Christmas say a lot about Jesus being a king, a baby? The baby in a manger is a king. And of course, our Christmas songs get this from the Bible because they come from the Word of God. The angel told the shepherds in Luke 2, 11 through 12, that the baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger is Christ the Lord. Amen? Folks, listen. If we're not careful, we forget that. Sure, he's our Savior, but he's also our Lord. In other words, he, he's in control. In other words, we, li- we are subjects to him. We live under him if we're living o- obediently. And so on this fourth Sunday of Advent, we turn to Psalm t- 72. Again, this psalm is all about a king. King Solomon is offering a prayer for the king. That is, he's offering a prayer for himself himself. And because of verse 20, some people believe he's just repeating the prayer from his father. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. But we know it's talking about a king, not just an earthly king, but we know that there's a prophetic element to this passage of Scripture that's also talking about the perfect king, and that is King Jesus. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. The question I want to ask you today is whether Jesus is your king. Is he your king? The baby in the manger, do you bow before him? Do you come and worship and adore Christ the Lord? Do you worship Christ the newborn king? Do you receive him as your king? Do you live for his glory? Do you bring him gifts? As was done by the wise men. Like the shepherds, do you tell others about King Jesus? You see, this psalm is pointing to someone greater than just the earthly king, whether it's Solomon or David. And I want to share with you several ways in which it happens. In verses 1 through 4, this is what it says. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people 
and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. Now remember, if this is Solomon, Solomon was the king who asked God for wisdom. Why? He asked them for wisdom that he may lead God's people, Israel. And you remember in 1 Kings, God didn't just give him wisdom, but he gave him things that he didn't ask for. Wealth and honor and prestige and wisdom and all of that. But you also remember that the Bible tells us also in 1 Kings chapter 11 that Solomon's heart turned away from the Lord. You remember? His heart turned away from the Lord to to serve other gods. So at the end of his life, we're told in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 9 through 11, that the Lord became angry. And folks, I'm here to tell you today, the Lord does get angry. We live in such a touchy-feely Christianity culture in our country It's almost sacrilegious to say God gets angry. God gets angry. He does get angry. It's all throughout Scripture. Matter of fact, there's Scriptures that says these are things that the Lord hates. God hates lying lips. Do you know that? God hates shedding innocent blood. That's Scripture. And we got to be careful because we live in such an age where people want to pick and choose what they want to believe about God instead of letting all the words say who God is. It's very dangerous, and I think that's kind of how we've gotten to the place that we've gotten on many, in, many, in many ways. But see, what ta- what, what, this first characteristic in verses 1 through 4 that's talking about this perfect king is the king's righteousness. The king's righteousness. Again, verse 1, give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. David, excuse me, Solomon performed righteous things, but he also did disobedient and wicked things. There's only been one king that was perfectly righteous, and his name is King Jesus. The perfect king, the righteous king. King. Again, in 1 Kings 11, 9 through 11, it says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twi- twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice, this has been your practice. In other words, this is something you've been doing repeatedly over and over and over again. So since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. And see, many kings have followed Solomon's rule, but none attained the pure rule of righteousness and justice that is spoken of in Psalm 72. Only King Jesus did that. In this sin-filled earth, we all look for a leader, a president, a government that would be righteous, that would do righteous things. But we don't find it in Solomon. We don't find it in David. We don't find it in any president we've had before. Why not? Because every human being that's ever existed apart from Jesus Christ, everyone has been marred with sin and deceitfulness. So the lesson of Solomon here is easy to understand. No earthly king or ruler is able to serve God in perfect righteousness and justice except Jesus Christ. And that's why it becomes a grave danger when people put their trust in mere humans. 
There's only one that's always been completely honest. There's only one that's always done everything perfectly. There's only one that holds us. There's only one that, 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 that died on the cross for us, and his name is Jesus. That's where our trust needs to be in. That's who we need to rely on. Jesus is our peace. But see, what we do is we live in a world that a lot of times our attention and our devotion and affection and there's nothing wrong with respecting people. We need to treat each other with respect, and even people that disagree with us. But there's nothing wrong with that. But I think sometimes if we're not careful, we're more devoted to people than we are to the Christ King. Mere humans. See, he's not a mere human. He's the God-man. And he deserves our worship, and he deserves our praise. And he deserves our affection. I think the proverb says, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. But we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Amen. So I pray for every president we have. I pray for our government. And we need to do that. But folks, I don't put my trust in them. Because they're mere humans. But Lord willing, with God's help, I want to always put my trust in Jesus. Because he's the perfect king. That's why the psalmist would say at the end of this chapter, listen, blessed be the Lord. Jesus is perfect. The king is perfect. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. I read a book this last week, or I'm reading a book. It said when you read the Bible, it's like you're medicating your heart. How many of you take medicine? Raise your hand. Probably everybody in here, most everybody. And praise God for medicine. And what is, you hope that medication does its job. And it brings comfort. This is holy medication. And when you read the word of God, and folks, I don't know anybody I've ever met that don't need holy medication. And to the, to the extent that you read the word of God and let the word of God get into you will be the extent of your heart health. Because this is what medicates our heart. And it's holy medication. We can get on the phone. We can get on Facebook. We can spend hours. Nowadays, they have, a, they have the ability, and y'all all know this, to track how much time you spend on social media. Six hours a day, seven hours a day. But I can't get in here. My holy medication? No wonder we're struggling the way we struggle. Because we're not in God's holy word. And we're not allowing it to medicate our heart. And folks, if we ever lived in a day that we need medication from the Word of God, it's today. Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You know what Satan's trying to do? Satan is trying to divide the Christian community in America. And if he can get us divided on politics, if he can get us divided on opinions, he's having a heyday. But I tell you what, if all those Christians will stay right here, he cannot divide us. Because this is the word of God. This is holy medication. This will do, this will do away. Remember, it cuts to the division of the soul and the spirit of the joints of the marrow. And it discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Even those secret hidden thoughts that maybe we struggle with. The word of God is able to cut those out. To your detriment. I love you enough to tell you this. To your detriment, you're not in the word of God. You need to know. I mean, your children, your children, how much do you love them? How much do you want to tell them truth? How much do you want to prepare them for life? You do anything for your kids because you love, you'll give your life for them. God gave his life for us. God gave his word for us. It's medication. Jesus is the only righteous, perfectly righteous king. There's a lot of kings that have done righteous things. Righteousness basically means right living. 
So there are people that are living rightly as a manner of living, but you remember what it said about Solomon. It said it was his practice to turn away from God. And it cost him the kingdom. So if you make sin your practice, do not be upset at God when he brings discipline on you. Because God disciplines those he loves. The second thing, verses 5 through 7, the king's everlasting kingdom. How long does Jesus' king la kingdom last? Well, look at verses 5 through 7. May they fear you while the sun endures. In other words, while the sun comes up. The sun comes up, praise God. And as long as the moon, throughout all generations... May, be, may he be like rain that falls on the mown grass. Hey, for those of you that like to mow like me, Miss Kelly, sis, my sister in, in the mowing community, there is nothing like a fresh cut, cut mown yard and the next day or the rain falls right after it. It just feeds that grass. It's health to that grass. May they fear you. While the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations, may he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. One day the moon's going to burn up. Scripture tells us that. So think about this. Every four years... We have a presidential election, and our presidents can serve two terms. They can be concurrent, or they can be consecutive, or they can serve a four-year term, not be in office, and then come back and serve another four-year term. And I believe, depending on the situation, maybe they were the vice president and they served two years because something happened to the president, they could serve up to ten total years, but not forever. Did Solomon serve forever? No. Did David serve forever? No. See, this is not the case with Jesus' rule. He is King Jesus because he is an eternal king, which means he always has subjects or people acknowledging his rule. Amen? So what does the, what does the reality of the fact that Jesus is an eternal king and he reigns eternally, what does that mean for you and I today in 2020 in this world we live in? This is what it means. The church is always preserved by God against the rage of the world. Are you standing on that? And also the eternal king, because he is the eternal king, there will be an eternal church, the body of Christ. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. If you're a Christian, that's you. Now understand something. That doesn't necessarily mean victory and defeat. See, we've, we've got to be careful that we don't allow our limited vocabulary and our limited experience dictate what we believe about grand truths. Y'all remember in the New Testament, you remember Stephen... How did Stephen die? He was stoned to death. Why was he stoned to death? Because he was a proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some people say, well, he was defeated. No. Folks, do you remember what he was doing while people were about to stone him and stoning him? He prayed that God would have mercy on them because they do not know what they're doing. Folks, you see, Christians can die in victory. Because of Christ. It's not one team wins and one team loses like we're used to. It's not victory, I'm, I conquered over this one. No, Christ conquered for us death so that we may have life. Because he was the perfect king. Let that medicate your heart. Leave today with that medicine on your soul. 
Because some of you are going to go back to your house this afternoon or some of you are going to pay attention to what's going on in the world and if you're not careful, you're going to fall into discouragement. And it is discouraging to some degree. But don't forget, we don't belong here. We're the body of Christ and the Bible says we're just passing through. But while we're here, we have a calling on our lives. Not just a preacher, not just a song leader, but every Christian has a calling on their life, and that is to go to all the world and share the gospel. Every member is a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The third thing, the king's realm. How big is the king's realm? How big is the perfect king's realm? You see, in these verses, verses 8 through 11, Solomon asked God to bless the size of his kingdom. Look at it. May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all the kings fall down before him and all the nations serve him. We know from biblical history that King David and Solomon, uh, during their reigns, they enlarged Israel's territory. We know that from, from history. Solomon ruled from the Euphrates River in Iraq in the north to the border of Egypt in the south, from the land of the Philistines in the west to the desert in the east. Yet we can hardly say that Solomon ruled to the ends of the earth. How many of you have looked at the nation of Israel on a map? How big is it? Listen to this. At its greatest, at its greatest in history, Israel was 500 miles from the top northern border to the southern border, just 500 miles. And its widest from east to west, 100 miles. Israel, the nation, could fit inside Texas multiple times. So we need to understand the power of God over this nation that he called Israel. By the way, from Angleton to Pensacola, Florida is 560 miles. To give you an idea. From here to Corpus Christi is 152 miles. So you can kind of get a picture of distance from 500 miles north to south, east to west, about 100 miles. So this couldn't be Solomon because he didn't rule from the ends of the earth. Who's this psalmist talking about? King Jesus. King Jesus. The Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians after them, the Greeks... The Persians, the Romans, all were bent on world conquest. Where are those kingdoms today? Where are they? Of course, Egypt is still a nation. You don't hear about the Assyrians. You don't hear about the Babylonians. You got Greece. You got Iran, the Persians. You see, these kingdoms are all gone or greatly reduced, but not King Jesus. Not the baby that we were born in Bethlehem that would grow up to be God in the flesh, go to the cross, endure sin for us, be in the grave, rest, getting the keys of, the, of, of, of Hades and death rising from the grave, defeating sin and death in our life, going to prepare a place for us in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God and also in each of your hearts as Christians. This perfect king, King Jesus. Let that be medicine to your heart. Jesus. And then lastly, verses 12 through 14, the king's compassion. For he delivers the needy when he calls. 
the poor and him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life. And precious is their blood in his sights. You know, it's interesting that Solomon prays this. And again, some commentators, because of verse 20, believe that, that Solomon is basically repeating the prayers of his father, David. Because you've got to remember, one of the reasons that God split the kingdom of Israel between Israel in the north and Judah in the south was because of the heavy yoke that Solomon inflicted on the people. And isn't this what kingdoms, earthly kings usually do? You look at rulers around the world today. Many of them look after themselves. They don't look after the people. They look after themselves. They look after their families. They look after people that are connected with them. They use their position to gain wealth and power. And in many cases, they care very little about the people that are under them. And many certainly don't have compassion. But not King Jesus. Eight times the gospel tells us that Jesus had compassion on the people. And out of compassion, he says to us today, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You see, Jesus is a compassionate king. It was never the government's job to look after the poor. You know whose job it was? The church. You know what the church didn't do? As a whole, we didn't look after the poor. So guess who did it? Took it up, the government. And then we complain about the government. You see, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We're the ones that are supposed to be having compassion. We, 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 we represent Christ on earth. We are his hands and his feet. So I ask you again, is he really King Jesus? Does he drive you to care for the poor? Does he drive you to look after the orphan? Does he drive you to, to take in the widow? king's blessing verses 15 and 17 long may he live may gold of sheba be given to him may prayer be made for him continually and blessings invoked for him all the day may there be abundance of grain in the land on the top of the mountains may it wave may its fruit be like lebanon and may people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field may people be blessed in him and all nations call him blessed. You see, Christmas is all about King Jesus. The perfect king is a righteous king. The perfect king rules an everlasting kingdom. The perfect king, his realm is from the east to the west, from the north to the south. In Revelation, it says, church, get ready. From every tribe and every nation and every people and every language. Jesus is king. And he rules that body called the church. And he reigns over that body. And to the extent that we subject ourselves underneath his lordship and be his hands and feet will be the extent that our culture sees Jesus today.
So, who is the perfect king to you? Take it home. Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all diligence for everything you do flows from it. Does the king have your heart? Because everything you do flows from it. What you know, that's important, but it's not everything. What you embrace with your heart, that's important. That's not everything. It's what you know, what you embrace. That is what you'll do for the glory of of the perfect king, King Jesus. That's what the world needs to see from us Christians. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for your word. And Lord, uh, we thank you for, for King Jesus. And we thank you, uh, Lord, that he uh, is an eternal king. He is the perfect king. And Lord, he reigns and he rules, Father God. And, Lord, we thank you that these are promises that we can stand on. These, Jesus is a refuge that we can hold on to, uh, Father God. So, Lord, I, I pray that for those of us that are here today and as we continue to draw closer to the end of 2020, Lord, the truth has not changed. The person of Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so, God, that perfect Christ, that perfect word, that perfect gospel is the answer for the world today. So God, help us to embrace that and help us to live it out. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.